turn our attention here in the studio to chatting to a man who's had a stellar career in the saddle until injury brought it to an end just recently. It's Midnight Shadow out in front, from claiming taking Forgan, and at the line it's Midnight Shadow to win the QTS Scottish Champion Hurdle. Danny Cook riding for David White and going much better. Great Endeavour's coming back to them a bit, but will hold on. Great Endeavour from Sonny Hill Boy. Great Endeavour wins. It's definitely red heading towards the closing stages of the Bet Right Trial Cotswold Chase. Victory is his. Definitely red and Danny Cook have won. Oh, well, delighted to have Danny Cook in the studio. Obviously, Danny, there's a, a moment of sadness that it's at the end of your career because you've clearly still got much more to offer. Uh, and the first thing is to talk about that decision, which is still so fresh, the fact that you've had to call it a day. Uh, because looking at you from top to bottom, you look absolutely fine. So talk me through it. Yeah, um, basically when I, I, I had my forehead and my injury and then I was trying to get back as quick as I could so I could... Uh, I didn't. It was early in the season, so I didn't want to miss. And the too fall much. was a year ago, October yeah, 2020. That's right. Yeah. So um, I was. I had my fall, and then I was. I felt perfectly fine within in my, within myself and in my body. Um, so I was keen to get back as quick as I could, because as far as I was concerned, it was just a bit of facial, and uh, uh, my, my bones were all still intact. So I was. Yeah. I was good to go. Um, so I was keen to get back as quick as I could. I got back quite quick, I think, um, and then I. I as I started racing, I just um, I just kept struggling to see out of my right eye. Just um, when I was going into the horizontal position and tilting my neck back, um, I had excess skin or, or whatever was kept flapping down and covering my eye, my eyesight. So um, so I was struggling, um, and then I called time on that, um, and then tried to just get myself better and uh, see what we could do. Um, but the hospital at the time says. Um, they they recommended against any operations or anything like that just because it it the, the chances are it could be make it a lot worse it could make me a lot more get double vision yeah. and make things a lot worse than uh, than what it is already. Uh, so. Are you all right with looking back at the incident on yeah. on Ravenhill Road? Um, because I imagine uh, some people might not want to see it considering the gravity of it now. But as you said at the time, you didn't think. It was that bad. No, it's just as a jockey, you always think as long as you, you move your legs and you move your hands or arms, as long as you can, your body's fine. Everything else is artificial, really. Um, so you think you just get get me back out there. Yeah. Um, but obviously, um, yeah, obviously, everything happened for, for a reason, really. But um, yeah, yeah I, I, when, when I first was coming around, I was checking to see if I was, and I was thinking, oh, I'm absolutely fine, but. Funny because I thought I was just about to come to win this win race, race at the yeah. time. I was in just third thinking, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking, go on in, play. And then it just. Uh, and it was the horse behind you. Yeah, I've, yeah. It, at the time, I remember watching. I thought, well, that's a, a relatively innocuous fall by. S but then yeah. you see. Yeah, obviously I was knocked out there for a bit. Um, just as I was coming around, I was just I just could feel I could feel tiggling on my face like when you're a bit numb and I was thinking oh, I obviously had a bit of a bang to the face um, and then when I started coming around I started to sit up and then blood was just dripping out and then I was just thinking oh, I, don't, I don't really know what's going on here I would, obviously I had a lot of blood coming out my right eye and I saw my right, my right eye had swelled up straight away so I couldn't really see out of it much anyway um, and then it was just literally they just took me to hospital and then when they got me in hospital um, they were doing loads of like intense searches into the eyeball and yeah. and stuff like that um so yeah it was all a bit all a bit of a all a bit of a palaver really at, at the well, time <laughs> you say it's a palaver i mean did they did they not tell you straight away that this is potentially uh going to affect you for the the, the time that it obviously did or did you feel that it was I think obviously jockeys yeah. push the boundaries a bit, don't they? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a, as a jockey, you would never give anyone the full intent of what injury you've got or, or how you're feeling. You kind of just um, kind of just try and carry on as best you can. 
um, and things have eventually come awry as they, as they have done before. You, you just carry on with any nig niggly problems and that you've got, you just carry on through it and then uh, um, eventually you come right and you get sound and then you're fine again. Um, but yeah, um, this one didn't seem to come right. Uh, I, I want to ask you about that attitude, if that's okay, because that's a positive in some senses. The fact that jockeys hide the full extent of their injuries, they want to press on because they they feel that they need to for for whatever reason. But also, it can be a big negative. It it wouldn't be, for example, the the example that you'd set to your, your children. For, you wouldn't say yeah. to your kids, hide hide your injury and and push on, and you'd want them to to deal with it. Yeah, I think um, I think the way the world's probably changed now from when I was growing up. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a lot older, so we was a lot just get on with it, fall over, pick yourself up, get on with it. Um, where I think today's everything's a lot more professional now. You, like you got the Jack Berry House, Oakley House, um, so you got all the all the you get you looked after so well now as a jockey. Obviously, when I was starting out, it was a long time ago. Yeah. So um, um, we used to just, so I suppose. You just get on with it. You just yeah. got on with it. Uh, it's just one of them things you did. You just got on with every day, whatever it was. Just go out and get on with it. Where now you you looked after so well. So if you've got any niggly problems or anything, you've got physios on hand. You got um, you got doctors. You got everyone yeah. there to to help you. So um, yeah, obviously things of time has, has changed and things have got better for for the younger generation coming through. So I'm sure they'll be a lot um, better equipped going out to ride um, than probably we was. So few years ago. Well, you talk about the start, so let's go back uh, to, to growing up in Romford and how you ended up choosing a career as a jockey and ended up in the in the Northern Racing College, is that right? In yeah, Augusta? that's right, yeah, yeah. I just, um, I finished school, I finished school when I was young, I was about 15, um, and my, my dad, uh, my mum was sick of me, so I had to go work <laughs> with my dad every day, so I was uh, working like on landscape gardening and uh, doing a lot of heavy lifting and hard work. and. I remember getting to about 16, I was like, oh, this is this is hard old job, this. I think uh, there must be an easier way of life. <laughs> and um, and I, my granddad and dad used to love the racing, so we used to watch racing every right. every weekend, um, have their little bets and place pots and stuff. Um, so I watched it with them, and I used to, I just got right into it. I was like, I'd be out for playing football with my mates, and then yeah. like, me, like dad would be shouting, like, the, your race is off, so I'd be sprinting back in to watch <laughs> me race, watch me race, then go back out and play football. Um, so yeah, I just, I just, Loved it, and then when I went to the racing school um, when I was 16, I went to the Northern Racing School, and uh, that was it. I just got, I just got the bug. I just loved the yeah. chemistry with the horses. Uh, it was great. Uh, and then you ended up, of all places, uh, at Martin and, and, and David Pipe. And what was that experience like? Yeah, it was, it was funny really, because I kept um, when I was at the racing school, and everyone was used to say, start with a small trainer and try and work your way up. You get more opportunities yeah. and stuff like that. And I did that, and. Um, and I did get some good opportunities off uh, Barry Levy and Andy Street, who got my license yeah. first. Um, I didn't have many rides though, and I just thought I was. Gonna, I think I must have been about 21, and I was just or 20 maybe. And I was just thinking, I've got to give this a proper go because, like, I'd, I'm not earning no money, and I'm getting yeah. older, so I need to try and either give it a proper go or get out of the get out of it. Because yeah. um, all I wanted to do was race, so that was all I wanted to do. Um, so I went to David Pipes. Um, I went down there and. Um, yeah, they were brilliant. They looked after me really well and uh, and 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 taught me like loads. They just you get out what you put in at Mr. Pipes, you know. Yeah. Um, the hard, like you was in every morning feeding, every weekend feeding, riding out. So the more effort you put in, yeah. that then they'd, they'd give you back, you know. So. Uh, and when you walked in and you saw that setup, I, I'm guessing that's the the most advanced setup that you would have seen and and been part of. In, at that stage of your career? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It was, everything was professionally run. So you had your assistants, you had your trainer, assistant trainers. Um, so yeah, I mean, the way it was all run, it was like a military operation really. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was just done really, really well. And uh, it was great to be involved in that environment because that gave you the, the grounding really to, uh, to be more professional about going forward instead of just trying to Mickey Mouse stuff. You had to, you had to do uh, stuff properly, you know. Yeah, and they not only gave you the grounding, but they gave you opportunities, uh, including a Cheltenham Festival winner yeah. uh, in the colours of, of David Johnson. Yeah, yeah, David Johnson was great to me, actually. Um, he, he looked after me really well when, um, yeah, here. It's actually funny because th th I think it was maybe 48 hour declarations yeah. in this race, or, or maybe the day before, but I remember David rang me and he said, because uh, I run on Al Vic in the Peter Master time, right. and I used to yeah. ride Al Vic quite a lot. And he says, do you want to ride Al Vic or Great Endeavour? And I says, 
Um, if I've got a choice, I think I'd ride Great Endeavour. And he says, well, you ain't got a choice anyway. And put down the phone. <laughs> and I was looking at declarations then, and I was just hoping I was on a Great Endeavour. Cause yeah. Although he had a low weight, he, he, he was lightly raced. And uh, yeah, he was there. Uh, uh, Timmy Murphy rides Shepherd Turgeon in the same Yeah, race. Timmy rode for Nichols that day, yeah. So it, it, it was a great opportunity for me to, to get and uh, and then to reward them all uh, with the win was, uh, was great. What was that feeling like? For someone who grew up in Romford, sort of, you know, ended up Northern Racing College. I think you, you could have ended up in the army as well, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah, to, yeah. To, to, to live out what you wanted to do, live out your kind of dream uh, at the Cheltenham Festival, when you were coming up that hill, hit that line, what was that like? Yeah, it was brilliant. I, obviously, it happened early on in my career. It's a shame I couldn't get another one uh, later on, really. But I just thought it was, oh, this is easy. This is. <laughs> I mean, every time I rode for David, we went to Cheltenham, I'd always be placed on a few of these horses every time at the festival. He just, he was a brilliant for the brilliant man for the occasion. He just yeah. literally get them ready um, for them days. And I mean, great endeavor that day was, was absolutely brilliant. He did not put a foot wrong, did not put a foot wrong. Very lucky to be on in that day. You talk about David Johnson and, and the fact that he gave you great support and your relationship with our Vic. He must have been a, a hell of a horse to ride as well. Yeah, yeah. Again, I was very lucky to get on him. Um, the first day, first time they let me ride him was uh, at Cheltenham and uh, I ended up diverting, taking the wrong course and then <laughs> I ended up getting a month banned. So um, yeah, that didn't go down too well. And then I feel like, <laughs> no, when you just feel like you let everyone down, yeah. you're like, oh God, this is like, wanted the turf to come and swallow me up. And um, yeah, my first ride back was back on Alvic yeah. at, in the Peter Marsh at, um, at Haydock. So then for me to go and win, I was yeah. like, oh my God, this is brilliant. Yeah. Like, because I know you're going out there all nervous. I, I hadn't rode for a month and the last time I did, I took the wrong course. And now I'm back on our Vic, <laughs> going to make the running again. I didn't know which course to take. So um, it was all Jump a bit, the big ones. Yeah, just Jump follow the big, the big ones. ones yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he was brilliant that day. And uh, yeah, we, we was lucky enough to get how, the win. How did they, how did they take it? How did uh, David Johnson and, and the pipe team take it? David Johnson was brilliant. He was like, it's just one of them things. He, he showed me great support throughout, throughout my career. Um, he was he was brilliant and um, and David Pipe again brilliant. I mean the next day I think I tried to I tried to not come in in the morning because I was sulking <laughs> and he come out and dragged me out to get <laughs> me back to work. So uh, yeah, it was it was they both took it well. It yeah. was it was one of them things. I I got done it a couple of times actually for David unfortunately, but um, these things are sent to try us. So they are lots of things are sent to try us. But you've been lucky. Not only do you have the association with you know the Pipe team, but also. You know, riding regularly for for Brian Ellison and the the Harvey and Sue Smith team. Um, how did those relationships come about? How did you end up riding for them? Well, the first one with uh, Brian, I was coming to the end of my claim with David Pipe, and I was just thinking I needed to get more opportunities. And um, there was an owner I was riding for called Dan Gilbert. He had quite a few horses at the time, a lot of uh, juvenile hurdlers and stuff, up with Brian Ellison. And Brian Ellison actually said to me, "If you're going to ride all of Dan's, then you can ride all of my jumpers." And I just see it as a good opportunity then to uh, to make the move north and yeah. and give it a go. So that things went from strength to strength with Brian. There we had a lot of good success, yeah. um, especially with the juveniles in them first few seasons. Uh, we used to do well with our juvenile hurdlers, and um, yeah. And then uh, there was a day then when um, Ryan Mania uh, finished in the saddle, um, and so Sue was looking for a jockey, um, and I think Ryan Mania actually put me in for the ride for um, uh, Stratton Hannah at Newcastle. Yeah. And um, and luckily it won, and then Sue started putting me on a few more. I think my first eight rides for Sue were all winners. Wow! So um, so yeah, we we stru struck up a really good relationship from there, and um, yeah, things again just went from strength to strength. Let's let's pick up on some of the horses that you would have ridden for for both of those trainers, and I guess one of the most exciting horses for us to watch over the season was Vintage Clouds. Uh, you know, clearly being the horse that he is. It's an attractive type of uh, proposition. But of course, he won a race that you did extremely well in. You talked about Alvik and the Peter Marsh chase. You won the, the, the Peter Marsh with Vintage Clouds in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Again, um, he, he won really well this day. It's the last time I ever got to sit on him, uh, unfortunately. I never sat on him again since then. Um, the last time I actually ever rode him. But yeah, that day was absolutely, absolutely brilliant. He uh, didn't, didn't miss a beat. I knew if I could stay in contention going down the back, he knows his way around Haydock. He finds two extra gears turning for him. So I knew if I could stay in contention yeah. going down the back, I knew when I met the home straight, he just, he goes. He knows his way home. <laughs> what was it like watching him at Cheltenham? Um, I didn't actually watch the race. Uh, did you not? No, not at the time. No, I watched the replay later on. Um, no, I couldn't really watch it. I was, I was, I was 
trying to keep busy, shall we say. Um, but I knew I, it was down to a, a really attractive mark. And his form at Cheltenham's, I think I finished second on him there. Um, and then third on him there in the same race, like a couple of years previously. So, yeah. um, and he was doing that off a mark of high 140s, low 150s. So he was down to like 144, I think he was, when he, when he won at Cheltenham. And I thought, if, he, if he's on that handicap mark, he's, he's, he's the winner waiting to happen yeah. when he's on that mark. Oh, he's, he's been a wonderful horse for yeah. you and, and for the team. Um, but we've mentioned the Peter Marshall. Should we have a look at another Peter Marshall chase win for you? Uh, let's head to uh, the year before uh, Vintage Clouds won it in splendid isolation. And this time again, uh, Sue Smith, Wakanda. Oh, yeah, Wakanda, yeah. Were you, were yeah. you confident going into the race that... He would win. No, no, not 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 at all. I know he's got it in his locker. He's 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 a fantastic horse on his day. He was he he kept getting little jointy problems and little leg problems. Not bad, but just little things just annoying him. So on his day, if he was going forward on a going day, he he he's a very very good horse. Very, I think the first five four or five rides I had on this horse, I won. I think I won like two Grade Twos. He he was he was a superstar. Um, I won a big, a big race at Ascot on him, um, and yeah, when he was this day, he was just, he was in no mood to get denied. He was, yeah. uh, he was brilliant. These, these staying chasers, Danny, are, you know, you look at the way they race and how genuine they are, and the way he's, he's flicking his ears. He, he looks like he's got more in the tank all the way to the line, like you've said. Yeah, yeah, I, he was, he was not going to get beat this day. He was, he was just in, he was on a going day, and he was just, he was just loving, yeah. loving life. The, the, the ground and everything was perfect for him. It was just like sometimes if you rode him on one day, the ground going into a jump might just been a bit quick and you just feel him backing off the fence about four or five strides out because he's just filling these legs a bit. But yeah. on this day, everything just ran right and uh, he just flowed through the ground lovely. What is the key to, to getting the best out of these staying chases? Is it simply a case of let's get them in a good rhythm uh, as long as they're jumping well and, and see what happens? Or is there something, because you've, you've got a, a tremendous record with horses such as Wakanda, yeah, Vintage I mean, Clouds, etc. I, st I started my career off as point to pointing, so um, I, staying chases is all I knew um, back in the point to point days. So um, when I come to, to, to ride under rules, <coughs> it was a natural progression for me to, to love staying chases. Yeah. <coughs> and um, yeah, I think with all staying chases, it's just finding that, that sweet spot, that's, that rhythm where they're happy, they're happy, they're not going too fast, but they, they're happy, they're traveling and they're jumping from fence to fence. They're well within themselves. So as long as they're well within themselves, every, you meet everything nice. Yeah. Where if you're trying to rush them up, um, you try and rush them up, you're just getting out of your comfort zone, then you start missing fences, and everything comes a bit hard work. So yeah. if, you can, if you can, just get them out nice and early, get them into that lo lovely flowing rhythm, and then everything just comes a lot more natural and easy. Well, we'll come to another staying chaser, staying chaser that you're very closely associated with. But before we do, I wanted to ask you about a very good hurdler that you rode, uh, who actually has done well over fences, and that's Midnight Shadow. Uh, won the Rail Keel at uh, Cheltenham back in January 2019. Um, made a good transition to, to fences. Um, on this day, he looked a, a really top-class hurdler. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, he was he, he was brilliant. He obviously won this race. He won the Scottish Champion Hurdle too um, the year before. But uh, he, he, he's we. It's difficult because this horse, I was with him from the day he was broken in yeah. when he was getting early doors when we was at Sue and Harvey, is just breaking him in and he's just, he'd done nothing. I mean, when he was a three-year-old, four-year-old in his bump days, he was working with like the likes of Vintage Clouds and stuff. Yeah. So when you've got horses that can do that from a young age, you know, you've, you've got a nice one on your hands. And uh, yeah, he, he, he was, we was hoping he'd be a really good superstar and he, he's done, he's done nothing but, but delight us all. But yeah. I was hoping he could, he, I mean, he finished second in the grade one, I think, in the, uh, Silly, I was at Sandown yeah. with me, um, and that that was a great run. But I was I was just hoping he could propel me onto that. Well, that that level. win in the rail keel, the way he travelled into the race, yeah. led a lot of people, me included, <coughs> th to think that he was a superstar because he, he did. He, I mean, his Holston and Old Guard that he beat that day, yeah. and they were sort of standard setters in the sort of middle distance, the the, the yeah. chasing, staying yeah. hurdle category. Yeah, I mean, he, he's got an unbelievably high cruising speed, unbelievably high. He, he, he's not a horse that normally, when you come under, off, under pressure, if you come under pressure three or four furlongs out, you, you're not going to get home. Yeah. He's a horse that, you, you, he's got high cruising speed, so you try and keep him on the bridle for as long as you can. And then that last two furlongs, he'll pick up and then run to the line. But if, you, if you're doing it five, four or five furlongs out, you'll probably get to the furlong and a half pole and then yeah. you start just tiring, you know. So um, he's got unbelievable high cruising speed, so you have to use it with him. He's yeah. a horse that you just keep on the bridle. 
Uh, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier on that when you were a kid and you, there was racing going on, you were out playing football, you know, your dad would call you in and say, your race is on. What were the races that were particularly notable for you? I mean, was it simply the festival? Was it the national? It's all the staying races, funny enough. Like, the, I used to love fiddling, fiddling the facts with oh, Nick Fitzgerald yeah, and uh, Nicky Henderson. Henderson. Yeah, I used to love them kind of horses. Um, Teet and Mill, Venetia Williams, all them staying wow. chased. I used to love all them, like the, that was my generation, yeah. go ballistic and all them lot. Yeah, my goodness, so, yeah. So yeah, so I used to love watching them, all of them horses. So I'd always follow them. And then you had uh, um, Cool Stock I used to follow a lot as well with Dobbin and stuff. So yeah, um, so yeah I, used to f I used to always follow them. So I guess races like, say, the Many Clouds Chase or the, or the Cotswold Chase, uh, as it was, would have been yeah. Uh, right up on, on the list of races that you would have enjoyed? Yeah, 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 definitely. I used to always watch them ones, yeah. Did you say definitely on purpose? <laughs> because that's the horse that red. we're going to talk about, <laughs> definitely red. I mean, how much do you love this horse? How much did you love riding this horse? Yeah, he was a pleasure. Was, I, was, I was trying to get him when he was um, getting retired. Um, I, was, I was trying to get him, but I was battling it, battling it out with his, um, with his stable hand, <laughs> Andy, who looked after him every day. He literally worshipped this horse, and uh, me and him were battling to try and keep him, but I think Andy, Andy won the battle, but he said, I can come and have a ride on him now and again. <laughs> um, I mean, but yeah. Is, this was some performance. That's Bristol the May back in third. Yeah, he was brilliant this day. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. This is where we thought we'd, we'd go for the Gold Cup and see, see what we got. But yeah. Um, yeah, he was absolutely, absolutely mustard. The way he picked up turning in, because I hit a bit of a flat spot at the top of the hill. I was struggling to go with American, and uh, I went, I'd just sit on him and just see, try and ride him just to get home up, up the hill. And um, yeah, as soon as I gave him a squeeze after uh, three out, he turning in, he just literally picked up and went. And I was like, wow, yeah. go on in, boy, away we go. Yeah, it was brilliant. When you talk about relationships with horses and the way people feel about them, I mean, we often assume, or certainly I often assume, that jockeys get this bond with a certain horse and, you know, they think about them a lot, they want to go and see them, they want to look after them. Like you've mentioned, I mean, yeah. is, he, is he the horse, the <coughs> horse that, you know, you've probably felt something really, really close with? I would say so. It's just, he, he's a horse that I just, yeah, without all of the, the wins and that I've got, there, there's some horses that I haven't won much on um, and I still, I love to bits because I just love riding them. For some yeah. reason, they just give you like that, that great, great feel and great ride. But um, with, with Red, yeah, it was one, because he's such a good horse. So obviously yeah. that, that, that class is for a lot. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, and just, it would helped where I got the best out of him as well. So it made me feel that connection. So we, me and yeah. him, we just like, we just trusted each other, you know, and uh, we just got a really good bond and that was it. That's, so, that's such a, sh you know, funny enough, <laughs> David Probert, who was in earlier talking about trust is such an important word in this sport. Um, funny enough, chatting to other people about, about horses who perhaps don't, don't know that much about horses and you try to explain to them, why is the trust between horse and rider such a special thing? And uh, I've tried to explain to them, but I think you've done it better than I could possibly have done. And I've often said, because horses, by nature, you won't find a horse going right. I'm going to run around, run around the field and I want to jump all these fences. That's mm. not in their nature, no. or, you know. Sort of in a question, well, they're not going to run into water no. and jump a fence. That's no. not. No. So, in order to get them to do that, you have to get them to trust you. Yeah, and yeah that's that's so satisfying, isn't it? Yeah, it's just that bond, especially from an early age with a horse, and then actually then seeing them progress. It's that bond that you that horse trusts you. That, as a human, whether it's me or whether it's you, but that horse, so it it's, it's starts from the, the breeding operation where the horses have to get the trust in the people from then, and obviously then they come into the yards and stuff. So it it's all starts at a very young age for the horses and, 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 a, and a breeding operation really. So once they get that, and then, then they come to, to us as they get older, and then we build up that special relationship with them. And then obviously we're, we're there till they're, till their racing careers uh, either finished or, mm. or uh, they've gone on to do different things, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, that trust, having that trust and that bond is, uh, is what us jockeys do it for. Uh, yes, winning, but it's that, it's, that, it's that connection between horse and rider. It's, uh, it's, it's unbelievable, yeah. How much are you going to miss it? I'll miss it loads, yeah. I will miss it. I will miss it, but time, time moves on. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? Um, Still up in the air at the moment. I still really don't don't really know. I'm working on the landscaping at the minute, doing um, doing people's gardens. So um, it's a bit bit of a difference from uh, from racing at Cheltenham or, or anything like that. But um, just for now, I'm just paying the bills. But I'd I'd like to do something in racing somewhere along the line. Yeah.
Um, I don't know what it'll be or what it's going to do, but I'd definitely like to get back into it at some stage. When you say you'd like to do something in race, you don't know what, is it something to do with the horses directly? Or yeah, with the horses directly. No, no, with the horses directly, I think um, I'd like to do. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a bit of time out through the winter, so I'm going to start riding out for people and out through the winter just okay. to just to yeah. go see them. And this, now the horses are all fit, and yeah. I can go see them all. So uh, I go do a bit of work and that on the on the horses through the winter. Uh, Danny, I always wonder about people like yourself who's been who've been in the sport for such a long time, and the without sounding cynical, but the use that you are to the sport, you know, because your experience having come up through the ranks as you did. You know, if you were to sit down with, say, people at the BHA or sit down with people in racing administration, which is kind of what I was suggesting perhaps when you said, I want to do something, you know, I imagine that the info that you would have gathered th during your time would be invaluable in helping make things better. So tell me some of the things that you think could be better from a jockey's perspective <coughs> through your career. Um, I think I think they're doing a pr pretty good job at the minute, especially now from when I've started out to where we are yeah. now. Um, so I think, um, all in all, I think the jockeys are really well looked after. As like you've got lots of healthy options in the weigh rooms now, so to to manage weight control. Um, hopefully the sauna is going to get done with, so no one's got a crash diet and, and lose a load of weight anymore. Um, and they're hopefully keeping the extra couple of pounds, which would help lads as well. Um, so I think as a jockey. I think we, we're pretty well looked after yeah. um, in that respect, really. I mean, obviously, it, it, it's it's the mental toughness and stuff like that's going to come into facts with the with all the Twitters and Facebooks and all that. Jazz. Uh, did you struggle with that at all? No, no, I, I didn't. Probably, I've, I always had people message me and stuff like that, but I, I never really bothered me, you know. Um, it, but I, I know I know it does bother people, you know. But um, it never bothered me. So if someone came to you in the wearing room and said they're getting stick off social media or they're being trolled or they've had emails or whatever from punters, disgruntled punters. What's your what's your advice to them? Um, it's, I'm probably not the best one to ask about that really because <laughs> I'll say man it up and carry on but it's not the right way to go really. Um, obviously you have to report it to the BHA and uh, try and yeah. take things forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my opinion was, um, I, I didn't, my, my opinion, their opinions didn't matter to me. My opinions that mattered to me was from my trainers or my owners yeah. who I rode yeah. for. So that's what mattered to me, where other people's opinions yeah. didn't really matter. Who are, the, who are the people that were closest to you in the wearing room and that you'll miss, perhaps, uh, <coughs> the, the regular contact with? Um, all of them, really. It's all, it, every day was a good day. Um, yeah, I, I had a good, good friends up north when I was obviously up north the last few years, but then I had good friends down south because I was a southern jockey for a good few years as yeah. well. So like the likes of Aidan Coleman, Sammy, I mean, everyone's been on the blower and uh, text me and stuff. So everyone's been yeah. really good. And then you've got Henry Brook and Husey and uh, Sean Quinlan as well up north. So, um, so I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I miss them all, but um, I'll, I'll still be about at some, yeah. at some stage. And uh, the, the tributes that have been paid to you since you announced your retirement have been tremendous. And Brian Ellison's uh, tribute to you where he says that there hasn't been a, a braver jockey that he can remember. I mean, when you consider the fact that, you know, yeah. AP McCoy and Richard Johnson have been riding and he's saying that in terms of braveness. I say uh, stupid, I'd say. I think, <laughs> I think he'd say stupid. <laughs> Sit still, Danny. Sit still. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you always say. My horse has jumped, just sit still. <laughs> like, but I see one, Brian. It's like, just don't sit still. <laughs> <laughs> but when you yeah. hear Brian say something like that, you know, yeah. it, I guess it must um, muster the emotions of it. Yeah, it does. It does. It's because it's not just that. It's when I'm talking to my agent every day. So you're always with your agent or the trainers and you're always chatting. So it's, the, it's, it's all of that. It's all of the hustle and bustle of it all that, that, what, that I did through, through the years. That's what I'll miss, you know, more than more than anything really, the hustle and bustle, talking to everybody, and then um, and then obviously the racing as well. Yeah, I won't well, miss the driving though. So no, that that's, that's <laughs> seems to be standard. Everyone <laughs> says, I yeah. won't miss the drive, I won't miss the travelling. Yeah, yeah, I won't miss the uh, But it has been fascinating talking to you, Danny, and I, I noticed there are loads of uh, de-cooked landscaping cards left out around <laughs> the office this morning. Uh, but hopefully we will see you back in the sport in some form or the other. Uh, very soon, and uh, and hopefully things will be onwards and upwards for you. Um, from our part, it's disappointing that you've had to retire, but certainly have enjoyed watching you and the relationships that you've had with all these horses, whether it's an Alvic, uh, Vintage Clouds, Midnight Shadow, and and Red, of course. Um, you know, I think there's a lot for you to be proud of in, in your career. So for, for what it means from us, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure watching you through your career. Danny Cook, thank you very much. Thank you.
Cheers. Uh, it's been a real joy chatting to Danny Cook today, um, and we certainly wish him the best of luck, whichever path he chooses in the future. But uh, we'll take a break. When we come back, Dave Ord will be back in the hot seat to go through this week's Talking Points.